39th pick in the 2012 NFL Draft, the St. Louis Rams select Tenoris Jenkins. Face, every time I move, I'm trying to make a play. Ask the lead by me, I was smoking every day. You know, Jenkins, uh, a host of questions about his character. Janoris Jenkins on the pick. I had done did some stuff. The best piece of advice I ever got from a mentor was to just do you. I know that sounds cliche. I can't really blame him for not wanting a narc snitch in charge of his fortune. Talent, yes. Uh, consistency and character, I'm not sure. Down the sideline goes Janoris Jenkins. Janoris Jenkins is known for his solid defense and speed as a quarterback. Hashtag sh- Bondu Janoris Jenkins. Just disgrace me. What I, the talent that I have and, you know, the thing that I did in my past. Man, I play football to play football. If they trade me, bro, they trade me. Like, I don't care. Like, Helmets are on the field. This team's too talented. I'm not going to settle for that. And there comes Jack Rabbit. A body was found at Janoris Jenkins' house. Uh, it's shocking. But, you know, I still got to come and play football. I know what's going on, what I'm doing. Um, people going to feel how they want to feel. Everybody had their own opinion. Everybody, welcome to BJ Investigates News, Sports, and Entertainment. It's a show I just created, might never do again, where we only have two stars, if you know what I mean. Not try, stars. Not try. In recent episodes, we've taken a look into Britney Spears' former business manager, Lou M. Taylor. We also discussed that Lou had more conflicts of interest than sense or oversight. In today's episode, we're going to keep looking into the public record on Lou Taylor and discuss one professional athlete's allegation that his coach tried to force him to use Lou Taylor's business, TriStar Sports and Entertainment, as his financial advisor as a condition for him signing a contract to play for the team. This story involves more conflicts of interest, potentially in my opinion, the NFL's collective bargaining agreement rules, but not too much on that. And Lou M. Taylor hanging up the phone in investigators' faces twice and threatening them with text messages that she was gonna call and tell on a title tale or whatever. Lou Taylor is a total snitch in my opinion from what's being reported in these articles, but let's get right into it. Speaking of conflicts of interest, I was on the internet in 2021, definitely not minding my own business, researching into Lou Taylor through the public record. And I kept seeing this same guy's name pop up, Jeff Fisher. For one, I saw it on LexisNexis where Lou's name was associated with some type of trust or something relating to a Jeff Fisher. I also saw it just kind of randomly popping up on Google searches. I saw it on one of those true people search background checks. I just kept seeing this guy's name, Jeff Fisher. Well, come to find out, Jeff Fisher is a huge football coach and he has been the head coach for some of the biggest most successful football franchises in the united states so i keep seeing this guy's name jeff fisher pop up in connection to my public record searches relating to lou taylor and that's what led me to this article and basically this whole video today centers around me stumbling upon this article that said this football player his name was janoris jenkins was making allegations about 10 years ago that like i said his coach Jeff Fisher was trying to force Janoris to use Lou Taylor as his financial advisor as a condition of his signing to play football for the team. Let's talk a little bit about Janoris and then let's circle back to this Lou Taylor, Jeff Fisher potential entanglement. Janoris Jenkins is a professional American football player who has played for major teams in the NFL, including the St. Louis Rams, the New York Giants, the Tennessee Titans, and most importantly for my purposes, the New Orleans Saints. Who that? Listen, get a sack. Best team in the league. What you know about that? New Orleans was like the best organization you've been with so far. Hands down. Janoris was a very talented player in college, and he showed a lot of promise to be successful in the NFL. Based on his on-field talent alone, he should have been a first-round draft pick easily. Unfortunately, there were a few, quote, off-field issues that some of the coaches had issues with, and those off-field issues would ultimately force Janoris's path to cross with Lucifer M. Taylor herself. Janoris Jenkins was born in Pahaki, Florida on October 29th, 1988. By the time Janoris made it to high school, he was a total superstar on the field. 
His senior year, he played a monumental role in his high school team, the Pahaki Blue Devils, going undefeated for the season and making it to the prestigious Florida Citrus Bowl for the FHSAA Class 2B High School State Championship. So that's a fancy way to say they went completely undefeated his entire senior football season and undefeated at the state championships. This game sure had some great plays and excitement and dived through the end zone for a 19-yard Blue Devil touchdown. Which they won. What a fantastic game. Janoris was also recognized as a first team class 2B All-State selection and Parade Magazine also selected him as an All-American. He was rated a four-star recruit by Rivals.com and he was listed as the sixth best high school cornerback in the nation. At the end of Janoris's high school football career, he accepted a football scholarship to the University of Florida, which was and still is one of the most prestigious and competitive football schools in the United States. So Janoris starts playing for Florida, the Gators football team in 2008. That's actually the same year I started college, so. And kind of like in high school, Janoris was a superstar athlete in college too. He was the second true freshman in the school's entire history to open the season as the starting cornerback. After the world saw what Janoris could do as a freshman, the awards started pouring in. He was named to the freshman All-American teams by college football news and sporting news publications. After his freshman year, he went on to play two more successful seasons with the Gators, showing everyone that he was a major force to be reckoned with in the field. Everything seemed to be going great for Janoris. He was well on his way to NFL fame and fortune. That is, until things started to veer a little off course. Touchdown by Janoris Jenkins. According to Janoris, in May 2009, at the very end of his freshman year, somebody tried to rob him by ripping his gold chain right off his neck. A physical altercation then took place as a result of this thief, and Janoris attempted to keep his own property from the unnamed thief's stealing hands. It's really not explained well in the articles, but for some vague reason, police did respond to the altercation, and when they showed up, they ended up trying to arrest Janoris, which he allegedly resisted without violence. One thing led to another, and the cops ended up using a stun gun on Janoris, arresting him and charging him with disturbance of the peace and resisting arrest without violence. Janoris did go on to do community service and remained on probation for a while, but eventually his record was wiped clean from this 2009 incident. He kept playing college football, and a couple years later, while he was still playing on Florida's team, in January 2011, Janoris was charged with a different infraction when police officers apparently caught him rolling a cigarette in the bathroom of a nightclub one Saturday night in January. He wasn't arrested, but he did have to appear before a judge and the team's new coach was not happy with Janoris. The coach had a point to prove and he was ready to make an example of any troublemakers. Well, it's great to be here. I am uh, certainly honored and proud to, uh, to be the head football coach at the University of Florida. And you know, I'm not a guy, I'm more worried about perception than I am reality, all right? And I've got no ego. My agenda is the players and the University of Florida, and it's about winning. And the first thing we need to do recruiting is take care of our backyard. But we're gonna take the right players. We have an evaluation process. I learned an awful lot when I went to the Miami Dolphins about taking the right players. But along with that, his character and different evaluations off the field that, that determined a, a great player. Janoris did stay on the team, but he was on thin ice. That ice would finally break just two months later in April 2011, when Janoris was charged yet again with misdemeanor possession of marijuana. He was summoned to appear in court on May 12, 2011. That court date didn't even arrive yet before Janoris was kicked straight off of the team. He wouldn't be deterred from his dream though. He made the best of his situation by continuing his education at a different, not as well-known college in Alabama called North Alabama to finish his final college football season. By the time his college football career approached its conclusion, Janoris had firmly established himself as one of the best cornerbacks in the nation. His on-field talent was indisputable. It was completely undeniable. But those pesky little charges would hang over his head, following him for basically the rest of his career. One year after Janoris was kicked off of the Florida team, the 2012 NFL draft was in full swing. Janoris had actually declined to go into the draft his junior year of college. Like in football, you can do that where you don't have to go to your last year of college. You can just do the draft from your junior year. Well, he declined to do that. And like a month later, that's when he got kicked out of Florida. So wasn't good. But he gets kicked out of Florida, he plays for another Division II team, and he still is gonna participate in the draft, and now it's time to do it like one year after he got kicked off the Florida football team. 
And during this whole process, it's like there's like a recruiting process that you have to do. And a big part of it is media. And I don't know, when I was researching for this video, it just kind of made me like sad because used to be, you know, in my younger years, I would look at these guys and think they were so old and so successful and stuff. And it's like, now I'm like 33. I look back on these interviews. It's like, I know that he was in his very early 20s when he was doing these interviews. And it's like, they had him answering these questions. It felt like Britney Spears, like legitimately. Remember when people used to ask her about like her divorce and her breast implants and how many people she, whatever her virginity, whatever it was. It kind of felt like that. It was like, people were asking him like, have you learned from your mistakes? And it's like, ugh, come on, like, I don't know. I, I could see why they were asking the questions. It's not like I don't see where they're coming from, but it definitely makes me feel like sad, like bad for him or something. Cause it's, you know, you know, everybody else on that football team is doing the same things, you know, kind of thing, you know, what anyway. It was just a year ago that Janoris Jenkins was a star cornerback for the University of Florida and a surefire first round pick had he chosen to enter the NFL draft. Instead, he decided to return to Gainesville for his senior season with the Gators, but that's not the way things worked out. Just days before the draft that he chose not to enter, Jenkins was dismissed from the Florida team following his second marijuana related arrest in a four month span. On talent alone, Janoris was, as I already said, undeniably first round draft pick material, but his off field reputation wasn't great. The media had really leaned into and played up those charges, framing them as drug related offenses and off field antics. Like I said, I had some issues and um, I feel like, you know, most people just characterize me as a bad guy and a bad person and um, I'm not a bad person. If Janoris Jenkins can convince the NFL of that, he should expect to hear his name called fairly early on day one of the draft because the league already knows he is a great player. And, uh, you know, just come out and show the coaches you know, he's not a bad player and because I went to Division II, I still can play with Division I talent. But, you know, just having fun. What I learned about myself is um, I'm going to face adversity. And um, it's how I respond and how I re react to it. And um, so far, I feel like uh, I reacted good because I know I'm not a problem, a problem child. I just made a few mistakes. I'm looking past that now and I'm moving forward. And I, I just thank UNA for giving me a second opportunity. Which does sound pretty bad and scary, especially when the competition for those limited spots on the NFL team rosters is so high. As a result of this reputation, pushed in part by the media, Janoris was not drafted in the first round of the NFL draft, but he did get selected in the second round. The St. Louis Rams, led at the time by a guy named Jeff Fisher, took a chance on Janoris and selected him as the Rams' second round draft pick. Um, you know, Jenkins, a uh, host of questions about his character, Tremaine Johnson, same kind of thing, an entitled attitude. So all these guys, I don't know if Jeff Fisher trying to save the world. Talent, yes. Uh, consistency and character, I'm not sure. He would play cornerback, the same position he played since high school. The Rams offered Janoris a four-year contract worth several million dollars. That amount included like a two or three million dollar guarantee and like a two or three million dollar signing bonus. And just for information purposes, normally this signing bonus is paid to athletes in a lump some all at one time. And it seemed like Janoris was perfectly happy with the offer. The very next day, after Coach Fisher had drafted Janoris to the Rams on April 28th, 2012, Janoris appeared alongside Coach Fisher in a press conference with the other players that had been drafted to the Rams the day before. Uh, I feel real great. And when he called me yesterday, you know, I just had a big, you know, the biggest smile in the world. And I just felt comfortable. My past is my past. I put it behind me and, you know, I'm going to come out week in and week out and compete to the best of my ability. So Janoris does go on to say that his children are actually his biggest motivator to keep him in line off the field. Uh, this is one of my biggest motivations to keep me playing, you know, keep me uh, doing the right things off the field. And he's very happy to be able to provide for them financially in the future. So it would seem like everything was going great for Janoris, despite the off field legal challenges that he had dealt with in the past few years. But as we already know, sometimes things just aren't what they seem. The only thing left to do for Janoris before he could suit up and hit the field was work out the fine print details of his contract and sign on the dotted line. And this is where Lucifer enters the chat. Yahoo Sports would publish a groundbreaking article in July, 2012, just three months after Janoris had been drafted to the Rams. And this article would point to some trouble in paradise and Lou M. Taylor was all up in the mix. 
According to this report published by Yahoo Sports in July 2012, the Rams head coach, Jeff Fisher, was trying to force Janoris to hand over his millions of dollars fortune to Lou Taylor and her firm TriStar. And according to this report, Janoris did not want to do that. See, Jenkins and the Rams still had not come to this final in writing, sign on the dotted line agreement with a formal written contract. They had only really been in verbal negotiations by that point. According to apparently four different sources who were familiar with the situation at the time, that coach, Jeff Fisher, wanted Lou Taylor of TriStar Sports and Entertainment to advise Jenkins on his finances. Apparently, Janoris even went so far as to actually sign at least one set of papers, establishing a relationship with Lou and TriStar. And he was doing this apparently to appease Jeff, the new coach, who had taken a chance on him. Yahoo Sports claims that they even got a copy of these TriStar documents that were apparently allegedly signed by Jenkins. Now, just to be clear, I did not see those documents, but they claim that they saw them. So Janoris had said that he had signed that first round of papers to kind of get the coach off his back. He says he never really had any real intention of letting Lou take over his money. Yahoo Sports did call Lou to confirm or get some type of verification on whether she was working with Janoris. And like I said, they already seen that first set of papers that were signed between Janoris and Lou, so they kind of did know that some relationship to some degree had been established. Well, when Yahoo Sports did call Lou to confirm whether she was working with him, they say she screamed in their faces and says that she does not work for Janoris Jenkins and she hung the phone up in their face. According to the author of that article, Lou then threatened them, sending them follow-up text message threatening to inform the NFL Players Association that she was questioned about Jenkins. It seems like Lou Taylor is a demon who has trouble controlling her emotions, in my opinion, but what do I really know? Anyway, during these verbal pre-contract negotiations, the coach, Jeff Fisher, apparently made Janoris' agent at the time promise that that agent was gonna find someone to look after Janoris' finances, a role referred to in these talks as a, quote, financial advisor. The story goes that Janoris had already fathered four children with three different women, and Coach Fisher was allegedly concerned that Janoris wasn't going to be able to adequately provide for his children once he got his paycheck. Even though he said, again, publicly three months ago, that providing for his children financially was his biggest motivator to stay in line. Come to find out that might not have been the full explanation, but more on that in a minute. So Jeff Fisher wanted Lou Taylor at TriStar Sports and Entertainment to take charge of Jenkins' finances and manage everything in his life, from administering child support payments on Janora's behalf, all the way up to giving him an allowance to live on as like a living stipend. According to the report by Yahoo Sports, Coach Fisher himself was a client of Lou. So he was simply going with someone he trusted for his players. Seems innocent enough, but again, this might not have been the whole story, and we'll get more into that in just a minute. Now, this stipend allowance and child support functions and all that would be handled by Lou Taylor at TriStar, and she and Coach Fisher were well on their way to setting this plan in motion. Unfortunately for Fisher and Lou, there were two major problems with this agreement. First and foremost, Janoris himself did not want Lou Taylor's talents in his money, and neither did Janoris's agent. The agent had already chosen a different company as the financial advisor, and they wanted to use their services instead of Lou. A big reason that Janoris and the agent wanted to go with the guys that they had already picked out was because of finances. According to that Yahoo Sports report, Lou Taylor was planning on charging Janoris $120,000 over the course of a four-year contract. Remember, four years, that's the same exact amount of time as Janoris' contract to play for the Rams. So the coach wanted Lou to handle his money the entire time of his contract on the team. $120,000 for four years divided by four, that's $30,000 per year that Lou Taylor didn't even have to negotiate to earn. Sound familiar? One of Janoris's chosen financial advisors named Sandy Cornelio had apparently also known Janoris since he was in high school and was prepared to do the financial advising services for free. Another reason that Janoris had his doubts about letting Lou run his finances was he wondered whether Lou would relay his personal information to his coach, which Janoris of course did not want. He wanted boundaries and autonomy to live his own damn life and spend his own damn money however he wanted to. And he was concerned that Lucifer was going to be a snitch about how Janoris was spending his money. And honestly, I can't really blame him for not wanting a narc snitch in charge of his fortune, millions of dollars. Like, obviously, I don't want Lou Taylor telling my boss or my coach or anybody what I'm doing with my money either. You should be able to do that in the private. That's a, that's a fundamental right. That's a fundamental right. That's just my opinion. The second major problem with Coach Fisher's Lou Taylor provision was the requirement that a player use a specific financial advisor 
is apparently a violation of the NFL's collective bargaining agreement rules. It's known as an impermissible precondition. In other words, it's against the NFL rules for any coach to put in a precondition like this one as a condition for joining the team before the official contract is signed. The NFL Players Association itself even did make a statement that a financial condition like this one was absolutely, quote, unheard of. In true Lou Taylor and Associates fashion, she didn't really seem to care about the rules or regulations because she clearly, in my opinion, don't think those apply to her. Coach Fisher apparently remained insistent that Lou's firm, TriStar, manage Janoris's money. In a subsequent report by another publication, Janoris denied that he was in any kind of dispute with the coach, and his agent assured sources that the contract negotiations were going just fine. But can you blame him for taking this approach? They had already spent like the entire last year on pins and needles, trying to make sure Janoris was even picked to play on any team. They didn't really have the most leverage in the situation because of the reputation that Janoris had gained in the media or whatever. So I can't really blame him for trying to downplay the severity of the contract negotiation snag issue. I can't help but wonder what the true story was at the time and whether Janoris did feel pressured to play along with Lou and Jeff to keep these off-field antics accusations at bay. And look, even at that time, they were in fact doing exactly that in the media. Then, the Rams tried to play around with Janoris Jenkins' $3 million signing bonus. According to reports at the time, Coach Fisher was trying to split Janoris' multiple million dollar bonus into four separate payments instead of a lump sum signing bonus. This would be unusual, because typically, like I said earlier, an NFL signing bonus is paid in one lump sum all at once. As the reasoning for this departure from normal, the Rams and Jeff Fisher stated they wanted to, quote, protect the Rams from Janoris's off-field behavior. And I mean, like, honestly, seriously, y'all, when you really think about it, what was so bad about his off-field behavior that it made anyone think they needed to protect themselves from it? It's two joints and a street brawl over a gold chain. Over the course of several years, uh, I don't know, I don't know. If someone's trying to rip something off my neck, I might bite him back too. It just seems like people were full of shit, in my opinion. They wanted to just use any stupid old excuse to play with the man's money after he tried to stand up for himself and expose their little scheme. But that's just my opinion. Nevertheless, Janoris did go on to sign a contract with the Rams in July 2012, but it wasn't clear whether he went with Lou as the financial advisor or not. There is vague mention in one article that the coach, quote, backed off that plan because it was, in fact, impermissible under the NFL rules. As far as Janoris goes, he went on to have a very successful NFL career and now appears on podcasts and other public appearances talking about his time in the NFL. Over the past few years, he's spoken positively about his former coach, Jeff Fisher, and he doesn't seem to harbor any ill will over the financial advisor issue. I did reach out to Janoris for comment on this situation, but as of the time of recording this video, he has not responded to the message. Now that might seem like the end of the story, but there's one loose end I wanna tie up, and that's Jeff Fisher's potential conflict of interest with Lou Taylor. Remember earlier when I told y'all that Jeff's stated reason for recommending Lou was that Jeff trusted Lou as his own personal financial advisor? Well, I looked into the public record for proof of this connection, and I found it. Not only that, but Lou and Jeff seem to go way back, maybe all the way back to like 1998, possibly even before. Lou is listed as registered agent on Jeff Fisher Enterprises, LLC. She uses her Brentwood, Tennessee address here, so she hadn't even moved to Hollywood offices yet at this time. The business went inactive on August 9th, 2005, which indicates to me that Lou and Jeff had been working together at least since 2005. And remember, Jeff tried to force Janoris to use Lou all the way forward in 2012, which would have been six years later. But Jeff Fisher Enterprises was actually established in 1998, so I'm not exactly sure how early on Lou and Jeff began working together. In any event, it does seem like they were working together at least as early as 2005. But there's more info I came across in the public record over the course of my research that, while it's not conclusive, it, it does make me a little uneasy. So I came across a reference to Jeff Fisher as a TriStar employee. The place I saw the reference made is not a court filing or an official government record. So definitely, definitely take this with a grain of salt but I would be remiss not to mention it at all in case it's important information in the future. It came from one of those free internet crawler people search websites, and it appears to indicate that not only did Lou Taylor represent Coach Jeff Fisher as a client, but he might've had some stronger ties to TriStar than just a simple client. As you can see from the screenshot I took a couple years ago, this publicly available people search page purported to list Louise Taylor coworkers at TriStar Sports and Entertainment Group 
We see two familiar names here, Mitchell Stanley Martin and Robin Greenhill. Mitchell worked with Lou for several years at various investment advising firms, including the one they founded together in 2002 called Stonebridge Investment Council. As you can see here, he's also listed as president of TriStar Sports and Entertainment. Stonebridge and TriStar also shared a business address for years, that same Brentwood, Tennessee one that we saw earlier. There's another familiar name we see on here, Robin Greenhill. And we do know that Robin did actually, in fact, and still to this day, to my knowledge, still does work at TriStar. So there's at least some accurate information on this list. There was another similar example from a different people search style website, also in the public record, that included the same list of people as, quote, contacts associated with TriStar Sports and Entertainment Group. Now, just to be very extremely clear, out of an abundance of caution, I have not found conclusive evidence that Jeff Fisher definitely worked for or owned TriStar or anything like that. The only things I have to go on are these two random people search things that could really just not be an accurate reflection of the real reality. But these findings were enough to simply make me wonder a few things. How and why did Jeff end up on these apparent employee rosters at all? And what if Jeff Fisher was more than a simple run-of-the-mill TriStar client? What if he was deriving more benefits from his players signing with Lou than initially meets the eye? What if Jeff was procuring some type of additional financial benefit from forcing his players into contracts with Lou Taylor as a condition of signing their contracts with the Rams? And again, this part is all just speculation. So let's talk about what we know for sure. We know for sure Lou Taylor makes money from clients. We know it was reported she was gonna charge Janoris Jenkins $120,000 for the four-year contract totaling 30,000 per year. We know that she would have received those payments without negotiating with the actual owner of that money himself, but rather his coach. And what kind of dynamic would that be? I totally see why it is against the rules. Can you imagine if the coaches could just say where the players had to put their money and what they had to do with it? It's very weird. We also know Janoris and his manager accused Jeff Fisher and the Rams of attempting to force Janoris to use Lou as the financial advisor. We also know that the condition was not permitted by the NFL's rules. And we know that Janoris did not want to use Lou as his advisor. We also know that this specific provision was holding up the contract negotiations, publicly putting Janoris's career in jeopardy yet again. We know that Janoris was on thin ice at the time because of his reputation in the media. So, I don't really know how far back Lou and Jeff really go. And I also don't know if their relationship is just simply a financial advisor and a client. But I do have some questions and it does reveal some alarming facts. In my opinion, just to wrap it up, maybe it's time to stop assuming that athletes and celebrities and musical recording artists and things are not at risk of being taken advantage of or pushed around simply because they make a lot of money because that assumption is frankly inaccurate. And whether we see it or believe it or not, at least some people have taken full advantage of this fact and in turn take full advantage of these athletes. If we ourselves don't see athletes and celebrities and artists and musicians as regular human beings with the same vulnerabilities and concerns as our own, who sometimes make bad decisions, who sometimes commit misdemeanor offenses, if we don't give them the benefit of the doubt and treat them as what they are, human beings, then how are we really any different than the monsters we claim to oppose? That's all I really had for today. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, Mina. Okay, bye.